Greetings in the name of Christ and welcome to Concord Matters, a show that seeks unity in the life, death, resurrection, and ascension of our Lord Jesus Christ, that by his word we may come to Christian unity by the study of the clear and concise teachings confessed in the book of Concord. As Peter boldly confessed, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. We boldly confess the truth of the entirety of God's inerrant word, nothing more and nothing less. And we do it all for the sake of a clear conscience in Christ. I'm your host, Brady Finneran, president of the Minnesota North District of the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod. Thank you for joining us on Worldwide KFUO, Christ for you anytime, anywhere. We continue to confess the truth of God's word from the Apology of the Augsburg Confession, and today with Article 16, Political Order. The Concordians were proclaiming the truth concerning the role of government because there were many different factions, not only in the Roman church, but also the Anabaptists and radical reformers who were trying to say, we don't need government, and also, you can't own land. So people are like, oh, well, uh, I don't like the government. Well, maybe land ownership isn't so good, but what do we see in Scripture? We understand that the Lord has given us political order as a gift, and we submit to our authorities. It also gets really messy as we look at the political landscape. It gets messy when you see the abuses of land ownership, but the role is not for us to try to come up with our own pietistic ideas. The role is to look at what God's word has to say. And that's what we do today. So open up your book of Concord, open up your Bibles, and let's continue to confess. If you have any questions concerning our study of the apology, send us an email, kfuo at kfuo.org, kfuo at kfuo.org. Joining us in the Confession of Christ, we, we welcome Pastor Adam DeGroat Cal- of Calvary Lutheran Church in Rio Ranch, New Mexico. Pastor DeGroat, welcome, welcome to Concord Matters. It's good to be back with you. Now, Pastor, I, I feel bad. I've always called you Adam, and uh, I know your bride for many years, called her Mel. And did I say your last name right? You did. You said DeGroat. <laughs> you, 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 you've gotten it. <laughs> Pastor, this is our first time together on Concord Matters. You're a regular guest here on KFUO on other programs, Thy Strong Word. Um, Tell us a little bit about yourself, uh, your family, and the work of the saints at Calvary. Absolutely. Yeah, no, I'm a South Dakota native, married a Rhode Island girl, and uh, we've been uh, in the office of the Holy Ministry. I've been in the office of the Holy Ministry for about 14 years, and uh, most recently here in Rio Rancho. I've uh, been at Calvary for four years and um, a very good, uh, good, good parish here in uh, in uh, the, the the desert of, of northern New Mexico. So I've got a, a 13 year old uh, son who is a hockey player, which uh, is, a, uh, is a big deal for the, the folks up north. And we still found sheets of ice down here in the desert and he plays lacrosse when he's not doing that. So we stay busy. Well, thanks be to God. A reminder to our listeners is to continue to pray for not only our congregations, uh, I'm sorry, did I say River Ran- Rio Ranch instead of Rancho? What is the actual you did, sound? Yeah. Oh my That's goodness. Okay. I'm well, how offensive, you know, offensive. So Rio no, Rancho. Yeah. And New Mexico. Too, it's, a, it's a misnomer for those who would like to come visit. There isn't actually a, uh, a river here, uh, and there aren't very many ranches left. Um, so. Um, but but if you would like to come down to see Calvary Lutheran, uh, we're located at 305 Unser Boulevard Northeast in Rio Rancho. Our service time's at 9 o'clock in the morning on Sundays. Well, thanks be to God. So keep to the saints at uh, Calvary Lutheran in your prayers for Pastor and his family. As we know, um, you know, as as a pastor and your family, you you they join us, they do join with us when we're in ministry. So continue to pray for them and also that we may be clear in our words today. So, Pastor, let's just get into it. We are in the reader's edition of the Book of Concord, Concordia of the Lutheran Confessions, and we are on page 194, Article 16, Political Order. So I encourage you, our listeners, as you hear the words today, first of all, may we be very clear that we're going to stick to what Scripture has to say, and then deal with the mess that we always are dealing with when we talk about politics and other forms of of order in our culture. So I just I pray for that clarity and that we may come together, continue to look to Christ. So we begin with a note. To clearly move away from the Anabaptists and other radical reformers, the Augsburg Confession states very plainly that Lutherans support the role of government. Christians have the freedom and the duty to participate in proper political order. The Lutheran understanding of God's work in the church and in the world has come to be known as the doctrine of two kingdoms. Hero Melanchthon articulates the distinction between the kingdom of Christ, which is spiritual and a matter of faith, 
and the righteousness of Christ and the kingdom of the world. Lutheranism confesses firmly that Christ came to set up no particular external government. God has, can, and will work through a variety of political organizations and forms to enact his will in the world. The church as church is not to interfere, as Rome clearly and often did, with the rule of the state. Today, the Roman Catholic Church no longer makes grand claims of possessing all authority in both the realms of the church and secular authority. Pastor, as we look at Article 16, political order, this note, I think, is a great summary. How would you like to uh, uh, start us off? No, I mean, that's that's fantastic. And I think the the one thing that uh, that, you know, our our predecessors in the faith were were trying to get um, get ordered and, and set us in the direction of is is uh, interestingly, I think one of the notes with that is that, you know, we note that this particular article uh, 16 begins with paragraph 53. And um, one of the things that I had heard as, as I'd gone through the study is that, you know, it really starts to go back to its original numbering when we go to the the sacraments and the and the and the number of the sacraments that we have. And 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 I think that orients us well um, to understand that what we were being taught from the very beginning is that God is the one who is is reigning over the heavens and the earth. And we remember back to Ascension Day where our Lord is raised in glory. He he reigns as the right hand at the right hand of God. And then the other thing is too is he he continues to to send his spirit and, and be with us uh uh reigning so to speak uh through the word and the sacraments here in the church and and then as we get you know through through these these articles in the apology we get to where we're at today is to say a political order is coming after we understand that god is the one who has given us those kingdoms because i think there has to be a distinction um and we can talk about this i think a lot more is to say you know the, the kingdom of the left that we have in this world where it's it's, it's civil government and those sorts of things and the kingdom of the right that is the 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 gospel, the sacraments, those things that are given to us by our Lord, they're not separate necessarily, or, or they, they're distinct, I guess is the best way to put, put that. And mm -hmm. that God is, the, is, God is the Lord of both of those kingdoms, and he gives them both for our benefit. And so as you look at this, it's, it's important because different, I think we have the similar struggles of today where there can be some extremes where, well, the government will take care of us in a lot of times people speak that way outside of the realm of thinking of God, or you think we should have no government, and also it's because it's the power of the people. Therefore, they also are not talking about God. Pastor, what are your observations of how the political landscape today and why this is an important um, article, especially the two kingdoms, as we live in this world today as, as the baptized? Well, gosh, I mean, first, it's it, it, I, I think it moves me first to pity in, in, in this sense is, you know, you know, remember what happens with the Israelites as, as Moses goes to Sinai. And, you know, I hate to keep harkening back to Ascension, but it is it is one of, I would argue, the most important days of the church year. I and mean, we have to go all the way back to May and, and to remember that, that, you know, what our Lord does there is, um, you know, or rather going back to Aaron is, is, is as 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 Moses goes away from their sight, you know, the people are, are, they want to have something tangible. We want to know that there's something that we can see that is ruling or reigning. And like you were saying, in those distinctions is that, you know, um, that people that want the government to take care of everything. Um, you know, it's one, that's a false distinction is to say, we would understand that, that God through the government is taking care of us through everything. Um, and the church has a role in that. Uh, and then the second thing is, is that, okay, those who would say, well, I don't want to have anything to do with the government, um, that we have pity for them, too, is to say, well, no, I mean, we understand this in the fourth commandment. Well, God has given us government for, for good use. And I think this article is so wonderful of, of reminding us, OK, yeah, I mean, they're the Anabaptists who, you know, in our day are the modern day. Um, what are they? The Amish, um, you know, and, and, and on the flip side, you know what this what this article addresses in terms of the Roman Catholic Church and monasticism that that, you know, we'll talk about it later in terms of not owning property is something that is that is pleasing to God. Um, that's a false distinction, too, is that, you know, why would God not want us to own private property if he's given us the seventh commandment and the ninth commandment? That doesn't make any sense. And, that, and this article really does a good job of explaining. So just to explain it, too, and I'm sure that the audience is very well versed in our catechism, but you know, the seventh commandment of not stealing and, and, the, and the ninth commandment of not coveting. Well, how can we steal if we don't have anything that is ours? <laughs> 
<laughs> it doesn't make any sense. So, you know, what this article does is it rightly orients us to understand, um, you know, that 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 God has given us governance. Um, and, and the beauty of this is, and Luther had this, I think, in his own day, men that understood, I think, differently. And I think this is to the, the answer to your question of our modern day. Um, Luther had men in his own day, uh, John the Steadfast being one of them and, and, and others, uh, that really understood and believed that the position that they had as a civil authority was one was, that was bestowed to them by God. And we as Lutherans would say, well, that's a wonderful thing because we agree, uh, and God says so, uh, that God has given us these leaders uh, by his own appointment. And it's a wonderful thing. Well, let's dig in because that is a, a important for us to remember, not only of the history, but of how it affects us today. So you are listeners, once again, um, I encourage you to listen and also pray and how this uh, relates for us today. So we're number 53 on page 194, Political Order, Political Order of the Oxford Confession, Article 16. The adversaries accept Article 16 without exception. In it, we have confessed that it is lawful for the Christian to hold public office, sit in judgment, determine matters by the imperial laws, and other laws currently in force, set just punishments, engage in just wars, act as a soldier, make legal contracts, hold property, take an oath when public officials require it, and contract marriage. Finally, we have confessed that legitimate public ordinances are good creations of God and divine ordinances which a Christian can safely use. Pastor, this is quite the list, and it is something that kind of perks my interest just because it's good for us to remember in our modern day and age, but also what do you, what do you break this down for us? Yeah, I, I mean, I think it's a, a good introduction, it's, but it's very simple. I think kind of moving backwards is I love how we see this last line that Christians can use with safety. And what that simply means is, is that, you know, you can be a soldier, you can be a lawyer, you can be uh, in a position of, 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 of the governor of a state or, or, or run to a representative office. And then the other thing for us as lay people is it sort of sets us into this perspective is that, okay, the government may very well do things that, that we are opposed to. Um, and, and, um, and it talks about it later in the article is to say, okay, we, we can stand in opposition to those things, but there is, there is a right order in which we do so. And sort of, I think that to put it into to, to, to modern terms is to say, to, to follow the paths that have been given to us and to make contact with those individuals who can, um, you know, who can affect some sort of sort of change uh, within those systems. And, and, you know, here, of course, in the United States, we have uh, a, a representative uh, republic and something that 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 is um, uh, a wonderful form of sort of representative um, uh, governance where um, our voice is the people. And this is the thing that why and I think this article is so important. Um, our voice is the people, but not just the people. We are the children of God, mm-hmm. and we have something to say concerning how it is um, that God continues to, to to rule and reign. And I think that's what we'll talk about in in, in, cha- in uh, paragraph fifty five is to say we are ruled by the gospel. We are ruled by our Lord, who continues to bestow good gifts, uh, most especially the forgiveness of sins and life everlasting. So, you know, we can go forward into any of our our varying vocations here in this world. Um, even if they're in the civil realm, and to do so with without fear uh, or uh, of, of of anything uh, that the world might might bring to us. Well, let's get right to that because that is an important transition. That transition, it's a part of this confession, uh, number fifty four. This entire topic about the distinction between the spiritual kingdom of Christ and the political kingdom has been explained in the literature of our writers. Christ's kingdom is spiritual. John eighteen. This means that the knowledge of God, the fear of God, the faith, eternal righteousness, and eternal life begin in the heart. Meanwhile, Christ's kingdom allows us outwardly to use legitimate political ordinances of every nation in which we live, just as it allows us to use medicine or the art of building or food, drink, and air. Neither does a gospel offer new laws about the public state, but commands that we obey present laws, whether they have been framed by heathens or by others. It commands that in this obedience, we should exercise love. Karl Stott was crazy to impose on us Moses' judicial laws. 
our theologians have written more fully about these subjects. They have done so because the monks spread many deadly opinions in the church. They called holding property in common the governance of the gospel. They said that not holding property or not acquitting oneself of law were evangelical counsels. These opinions greatly cloud over the gospel and the spiritual kingdom and are dangerous to the commonwealth. For the gospel does not destroy the state or the family, but rather proves them and asks us to obey them as a divine ordinance, not only because of punishment, but also because of conscience. Pastor, as you look at this, it speaks a lot about we are people of the gospel, but we live in the world, not of the world at the same time. Explain that to us according to the confession. Holy mackerel. Yeah. And I mean, the the the, the paragraphs that you just read, I mean, it covers so much in, in terms of of the, the, the practical understandings of, of how we see this working out in the world. Of course, 54 begins with the distinction of the two kingdoms and, and, and kind of what that looks like is to say, okay, well, we understand that there's a distinction God's given us and, you know, the kingdom of the, of the, of the right, you know, this, this begins and, 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 and is given to us as a spiritual thing. Um, and, and it's given to us at our, you know, as it says in our hearts. Um, and yet what we see is that, um, this is also something that we that we're given within the church, but also we're we're, we're living this out. And there's so many as this as I had said before, um, we make distinctions, uh, but they are not necessarily different in the sense that um, you know uh, in our our personal lives, you know, um, God has given to us the family, the church, and 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 um, in that we're we're brought to the we're brought to the gospel, we're brought to 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 faith by by the Lord's word, by the working of the Holy Spirit. But there's, we would understand, too, that there is still some order, um, a father, a husband, a wife, a father and a mother. Um, and so those are those are matters of the kingdom of the left. You know, Calvary Lutheran Church, which is where I'm at. Um, we have we have a 501c3 status. We're a business uh, in the eyes of the state of New Mexico. And we have uh, articles of incorporation. We have uh, bylaws and a constitution. That's matters of the kingdom of the left. Uh, and, and, you know, and yet. You know, as it continues to go on, I think, you know, 55 really begins to 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 sort of tap the brakes a little bit is to say, OK, here's the wonderful thing the, the gospel. Do, uh, neither does the gospel bring new laws concerning the civil state, but commands that we obey present laws. And so, you know, what a wonderful uh, comfort this is for us to say is that we as Christians are are children of the gospel. And are able to go about. I think that the the doctrine of vocation really comes into this as well, is to say, um, you know, I am not the governor of New Mexico. Uh, I might have really great ideas about how to rule and govern the state of New Mexico, but but I would I would argue to the audience and to you, Pastor Finner, there's a reason I'm not the governor of New Mexico. <laughs> I, I I would not I would not see to that um, to that office um, in the same way. Uh, that I would see to the office that's been given to me as a pastor. And 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 the beauty of that is, is that God has ordained this to be so. And so that I am compelled. And I think the other thing that it talks about here is, is love. And I think we could talk an awful lot about this because, you know, what it's really saying here is that, okay, love as we understand it in the gospel, not love as we understand it according to the ways and the whims of culture or of the world. And right now it's 2024, the elections, you know, two months away, we have all sorts of different things that are going on where are, there's arguments over identity and the world's definition of love seems to be, well, we'll permit anything, anything goes, uh, whatever you would wish to do. And that's not the, that's not what the, the, the what they're talking about here uh, in this particular article. We're talking about that we are ruled by love in the understanding that God has given us these things because he loves us. And that we love and and and, and honor in, in accordance to the fourth commandment, those who have been put into positions of authority over us. And if we find that they are not, uh, you know, uh, seeing to their duties uh, as well as they as they should, that we pray for them, and and then also see where we might be able to to contribute, to help, or to to change what's going on, um, you know, by a means that would be legal, lawful. Uh, and and um, and civil, I guess, is the best way to put that. And as we look at these words, it's very it's very helpful, but also can be very confusing for people. It says, 
neither does the gospel offer new laws about the public state, as you mentioned. And it is, it is something where we can talk about, it's kind of like when Jesus, he did not come to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. And just it's good for us to continue to understand that part of our role as Christians, our major, I mean, our role as Christians is to worship, be in the word, you know, receive the sacraments, live out that life and live a holy life in our daily vocations. And at the same time, like you say, we have to have these laws and we follow these laws. We go through these laws and not to say, um, because I'm saved, therefore I don't have to follow the laws. (laughs) <laughs> right. or or that because my governor is not a Christian, therefore I don't need to listen to them. And so that that is a, a distinction that is, is very plain, very simple, but also very messy in just how we live our daily lives. Any thoughts on that, on, on, on those distinctions and really kind of the messiness that we're dealing with in, in our culture, especially? Well, absolutely. I mean, I, I guess my first question is, you know, well, what, well, what, what's messy about it? Um, and I think we can answer that first in the negative. Uh, God is not the author of the messiness. <laughs> this article is about order and, and not order in the sense of, of compulsion or order in the sense necessarily of law, but order in the sense that Christ has rightly ordered heaven and earth by his death and resurrection. And, and this is the beauty of what he says to them prior to his death and, and resurrection and, and, and in between the time of his, of his resurrection and the ascension is he has overcome the world. And um, and yet Jesus does tell them, of course, uh, in this world, you will have tribulation. You know, interestingly, and I, I would love to hear what your thoughts are on this, Pastor Finner, and is, you know, I, I had preached this a couple of weeks ago is to say, you know, Jesus is very clear as to say, um, <clears throat> in this world, you will have tribulation. But the devil seems to be the one, and we see this in Jeremiah too, where the false prophets are, are saying, peace, peace, but there is no peace, mm. is you know, the devil is, is, is seeking to come to provide us with, uh, I, you know, I say this tongue in cheek, another set of order, but in reality, it is disorder. Mm-hmm. And I think that speaks to your question, Pastor Finner, in the sense of, um, you know, w- w- who's the author of the disorder that we have here? It's, it's the father of lies, the one who scatters and the one who separates. And as he continues to do so, he does so by way of, of okay, what's the hot topic of our day? It's identity. Mm-hmm. God forbid, Pastor Finneran, you know, we as the baptized children of God, there it is. That is our identity. If we lose track of the fact that we have a baptismal identity, then not just my fear, the reality I think we're seeing right now is, you know, we will succumb to this idea of, of being, um, <laughs> you know, uh, being identified uh, as, you know, uh, of if you're a man thinking that you can be a woman or, or vice versa, all sorts of terrible things come as a result of that. So this article is about how God has ordered things by the gospel. And part of how he's done that is by giving us the civil governments. Um, it's, it's wonderful. I, I think how the, how the writers you know put this in this, in this article is to say, we're always having to think about this from the identity as baptized children of God and, 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 and having that, we begin to see that God is still a God of order and he is continuing to give this, even though men in this world might be getting in the way. Well, I think, I think you said it, I think you said it well, um, that one of the, you think about identity today, and this is why we know we need the church more importantly, why people need Jesus is that is the big question. What is your identity? And the government will bring out more questions, I would say. Our culture specifically will bring out more questions like, well, when you're in the womb, are you a baby or are you not? Um, yeah. When you are a young child and the doctor has proclaimed you a male or female, and then you get older, like, well, I'm not so sure. My heart tells me something different, which shows you the different language of what they were speaking of. Because in, in uh, 54, it says, begins in the heart. And it's very clear throughout scripture, we need a new heart. So when our heart is telling us more disorder, meaning I'm not sure what I am, um, the government kind of and the culture kind of says, well, you know, you're not quite sure. But we would say, no, we know who you are, the baptized. We know you're the created ones um, by a creator. In Christ, you are a new creation. And so it really is showing that there's good order, but the good order has a, I don't know how you say it, it can only go so far because you need to know of the identity you have in Christ 
because it otherwise it just gets more and more messy. Pastor, one minute before I break. Any last thoughts before we move? Yeah, on? no. And on that, I, and this is one other thing too. And, you, and to your point with regard to it going back to the heart is you know, but this affects us as Christians too. Is to say you, you know, um, and our Lord is very clear about this: where your heart is, there you know, where your treasure is, there is where your heart is, etc. So on. Um, you know, and this affects us as Christians too. Our our, our baptismal identity is preeminent. And yet so often we struggle with, well, gosh, what's my identity? Am I a Christian or a soccer mom? Am I a Christian or a hockey dad? Am I a Christian or somebody who needs to, to, to make sure that I, you know, you know, am I a Christian and uh, whatever it happens to be? And, and the reality is, is that, you know, for us as Christians too, uh, we can't uh, overlook the fact that there's temptations for us as well to be taken away from the gospel on, on, on each Lord's day. And we need to be be aware of that, is that our Lord rightly orders this and says, no, you are the baptized children of God. Be where I have promised to be, giving you the gifts that I have promised to give you. We're going to talk more about this on the other side of our break. We are studying the truth of political order from the Apology of the Augsburg Confession with Pastor Adam DeGroat, and we'll be right back. Showing support for KFUO is now easier than ever. You can sport a KFUO shirt, swag, or even socks by visiting our online store. Go to kfuo.org slash store and order high quality KFUO branded merch. You no longer need to wait for our annual share for a chance to show your KFUO spirit. Visually share and wear this ministry out in the world by checking out our selection. Every purchase helps to support our proclamation of Christ for you anytime, anywhere. Go to kfuo.org slash store. Welcome back. We are studying the scriptural understanding of political order from the Apology of the Augsburg Confession with Pastor Adam DeGroat of Calvary Lutheran Church in Rio Rancho, New Mexico. Pastor, let's keep moving forward because there are some important distinctions that they are making um, throughout the time. So we're on page 195, uh, section 58, 195. Julian the Apostate, Celsus, and very many others objected to Christians that the gospel would tear states apart because it forbade legal remedy and taught certain other things ill-suited to political association. Origen, Nazinius, and others wonderfully worked on these questions. However, they can easily explain, if we keep this in mind, the gospel does not introduce laws about the public state, but is the forgiveness of sins and the beginning of a new life in the hearts of believers. Besides, the gospel not only approves outward governments, but also subjects us to them, Romans 13. In a similar way, we have been necessarily placed under the laws of seasons, the changes of winter and summer, as divine ordinances. The gospel forbids private remedy. Christ instills this often so that the apostles do not think they should seize the governments from those who held otherwise, just as the Jewish people dreamed about the kingdom of the Messiah. Christ did this so that the apostles might know they should teach that the spiritual kingdom does not change the public state. Therefore, private remedy is prohibited, not by advice, but by a command. Matthew 5, Romans 12. Public remedy, made through the office of the public official, is not condemned, but is commanded and is God's work, according to Paul. Now, the different kinds of public remedy are legal decisions, capital punishments, wars, and military service. Clearly, many writers have thought wrongly about these matters. They were an error that the gospel is an outward, new, and monastic form of government. Also, they did not see that the gospel brings eternal righteousness to hearts while it outwardly approves the public state. So it, it speaks a little bit historical, and then it, it gives us a few uh, thoughts to ponder. For, for example, legal decisions, capital punishment, wars, military service, that this is the public remedy that our Lord works through. What else do you have for us? Yeah, well, I, I mean, you know, going back even like to, to, to 56 and 57, I mean, to, it sets to sort of the stage to say, okay, you know, they're addressing the Anabaptists and they're also addressing the Roman Catholic Church and, and with regard to to um, the not holding of public property being, being one of the figments of, of monasticism. 
And, and then they continue to go on to mention Julian the Apostate and Celsus. These were, these were guys, Julian the Apostate was the last uh, Roman emperor, emperor that was not a Christian and wanted to return to, you know, civil ordinances and, and whatnot, more specifically Hellenistic, um, you know, uh, Roman spirituality, so to speak, of Roman gods and whatnot. And, and what they were saying is that, okay, um, is that these, these Christians or whatever it happens to be is, this is, this is, this is, this is a danger to the good order. And, and I think we know that this is not necessarily the case at all, because the gospel is, is, is giving us the, the true good order in, in light of what we talked about before the break in terms of what true love is, uh, is understanding that we have not been given earthly kings as gods, but we have been given earthly kings as representations uh, to, to bestow the gifts that God freely gives within the civil governance. So that's just one thought amongst many. But um, there's others, plenty of others to talk about. And so let's just talk about the role, the role of the Christian. Um, we can talk about, therefore, like, for example, in, in number 59, therefore, private remedy is prohibited, not by advice, but by command. And, and public remedy made through the office of the public official is not condemned, but commanded by God's work. And so when the government makes a decision, we don't like, so you have a good Christian in your congregation goes to your congregation in Calvary Lutheran in Rio Rancho, New Mexico. They come to you and say, I don't like a decision they made. And it is not explicitly, for example, uh, something like abortion. Uh, that is not explicitly something that we would say is, is wrong as a Christian. Well, how would you encourage your congregational member as a Christian and living in the two kingdoms? Yeah, I, it's just uh, I think the, the simplest thing is to say, you know, we're, we're, we're not in a position to take the law into our own hands. And, you, you know, in the in a situation of the of abortion clinic, um, we would we would agree and confess with our Lord that, you know, life is is given as a precious gift. And and there's nothing prohibiting by virtue of our civil law protest. Uh, but there there may be temptations to to step over certain lines um, uh, to. To, to, to violate civil laws. Uh, and as Christians, we are not compelled, or we, we shouldn't be doing those things. Uh, but to petition and to, to, to organize and do things, every, you know, everything within a good order according to the law and the governance that's been given to us. And so what do we do, for example, as I mentioned, is abortion. Abortion that is, in my state that I reside in is is Minnesota is very, there's a big push to try to open up more abortion laws. I'm assuming New Mexico has some pretty liberal views on that as such. What is the appropriate nature of how to get involved and to proclaim the truth as Christians with a law such as that? Well, yeah, this, and that's why this article is so important is, um, well, gosh, you know, pray uh, is one. We were given to pray in the gospel. Uh, the second one is, is well, there's petitions and, and and organizations that are that are are fighting the good fight concerning that, and that's one one thing. And and, and everything has to be you know tempered according to vocation. Is is if you're a husband or a wife and are not afforded the time to to, to do more than that, then then that's good and, and pleasing in the sight of our Lord, because we don't want to give ourselves over um, to vocations to vocations that would steal us from from the, the vocations that God has given us, husbands and wives and fathers and mothers. But it may be the case that you 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 also might consider running for political office. Um, you know, it's a, that's another thing that this article says is is uh, that we, we we can be given to do that to become a magistrate, to become a representative, to become not a king, of course, but to some somebody who is 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 uh, orchestrating these things from um, from those positions of authority. So there's a lot of options that are given to us as Christians, and I think that's the beauty of the freedom of the gospel. Is is um, our Lord is ultimately the one who is watching over all of this and, and guiding and directing, uh, guiding, directing all of it. And this is an important distinction that pastor has made is the understanding of vocation. The holy callings our Lord gives to us every day. Clearly the calling of being a baptized and redeemed child of, of God through the blood of Jesus and his resurrection. That's, that's your identity. It's always important for us to consider, okay, who are the ones closest to me? This is how I would break it down, Elise, and I'd love to hear your thoughts, Pastor, is, uh, is okay, I got to care for my bride, as I'm commanded to in Ephesians, to love her as Christ loved the church. 
The Lord has given me four children, and I have to make sure that I'm fulfilling that vocation above others. That's the most holy and closest thing to me. Um, and so if I am like, well, I need to go to the state capitol every day in order to plead my case with all the politicians, and I'm never home to pray with my children or provide for their needs or to listen to them or my bride to care for her, um, well, then I have my vocations out of order. Um, so that is a very important reality for you, our listeners, to consider. And Pastor, what do you, as we look at political order, uh, you you already mentioned this, but I just want to hear more if you wanted to break down that vocational understanding when we look at two kingdoms and the political order. Well, I, and I think, and we'll get to it once we get to the last paragraph. Is is you know we see this with the Pharisees specifically, is they they were ones that were <laughs> giving all of their money to to the temple, um, and. And 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 in 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 the, in the New Testament, I mean, and even in the old, it was called korban. Uh, so mm. they would give the korban to the church, but but that was a great detriment to their own fathers and mothers. And you know, and our Lord is is making the point is to say, um, you, you know, you are forsaking your 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 vocation as a son or a daughter uh, in doing something uh, which you believe is going to make yourself right in the eyes of God. And, and, and all the while um, violating your vocation to be a son or a daughter. Um, but going back to the point you, you, that was made before is to say, you know, but I can I can talk to uh, my wife concerning, you know, this thing being an important thing. I can go there if, if I, I have her approval, uh, et cetera, so on. And I see that in, in, in many aspects of people's lives is, you know, my highest vocation is that of husband, uh, second being father and, and then pastor. Uh, but I think most pastors and I think parishioners understand this too, is that that does not mean that I spend most of my time at home, much to my, you know, much to my shame often. Um, but at the same time to understand that, you know, what it's not, it's not to, to not to necessarily say it's all to say the hierarchy is, 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 and has been given to us by God, uh, that, that we might know that we have freedom within those bounds, I think is the clearest way we can put that. And that's why I encourage you, our listeners, to continue to pray, um, to consider how you would be involved. But also, I, I can tell you this, if you're anything like me, I have not prayed for my governing authorities nearly as much as I should. I have not um, been in the scriptures nearly as much as I should. And so before I start thinking I'm going to change the world through some kind of political <laughs> maneuvering, let's make sure we keep it in order to pray for those governing authorities um, to be in the Word of God, to be in the body of Christ, and then also to prepare to continue to um, be very forthright with your family of the convictions you have of identity in Christ, of of what Scripture very clearly says, and to work together on um, how you best can serve as a citizen of your country. So the next the next section in sixty one is is kind of a transition, a transition that is part of this, but also has a little bit different topic. It is a different topic, which I think is an important one even for us today, especially when you think of, um, for example, our where I reside nearby, there is a monastery. And, and it's interesting because I know some of the monks. It's just interesting to have those conversations. And sometimes you're like, huh, that might be the more holy way of living. And how would we see that as Christians or especially as Lutherans? We're in number 61. It is also a most empty myth that Christian perfection consists in not holding property. For Christian perfection does not consist in contempt for public ordinances, but in the inclinations of the heart, in great fear of God, and in great faith. Abraham, David, and Daniel, even in great wealth and while exercising public power, were no less perfect than any hermits. But the monks have spread this outward hypocrisy before the eyes of the people. They have done this so that the things in which true perfection exists could not be seen. How they have praised holy property in common as though it were evangelical. But these praises are very dangerous, especially since they are very different than the scriptures. Scripture does not command that we hold property in common. The law of the Ten Commandments, when it says you shall not steal, distinguishes rights of ownership and commands each one to hold what is his own. Clearly, Wycliffe was speaking madness when he said the priests were not allowed to hold property. There are countless discussions about contracts, good consciences, 
can never be satisfied about them unless they know the rule that it is lawful for a Christian to make use of public ordinances and laws. This rule protects consciences. It teaches that contracts are lawful before God just to the extent that the public officials or laws approve them. So, Pastor, when I've gone to St. John's University and hung out with some monks, have they chosen a more Christian perfection than me because they don't own land and I do? <laughs> uh, I'm sure they're, they're, they're fine <laughs> gentlemen, um, but, but no. Um, you know, and I think, you know, this is the, the, the beauty of, of, of how our Lord, and I think at the third commandment in, in this, I often, I often hear this. I don't often hear it at Calvary, but, you know, with regard to the third commandment, I love Jesus, but, but, but the people at his church, I don't really, uh, and, you know, and I think about that in this way is that, you know, if, if somebody came and, and, you know, made a comment about our wives, uh, you know, but they said they liked us, but not our wives, et cetera. So and anyway, I digress. The whole point is, is that, God has put us into the community and the family, the body of the church first, and has formed up, formed up around us uh, these civil governances. And where the monastics, specifically the Roman Catholics, had, had sort of gotten wrong was, was not necessarily in, in retreating away from that. I mean, even our Lord did that, and we should do that as Christians in prayer and meditation and, and whatnot. Where I think the monastics went wrong was in making the distinction that it was somehow a higher or more holy order. And the unfortunate thing is, is that um, I think many lay people often will look at this and say, well, gosh, that's that's the, the way it is. Or, you know, Christians will talk in our modern day as, as things fall off their hinges is to say, well, gosh, we need to we need to create our own little communes, Christian communes or whatever it happens to be, you know, and 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 and, and be separate from the government, 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 because civil government is bad, but that is not what the article is saying. Civil government is good. Um, and we as Christians can continue to remain in this um, to to affect um, wonderful and good things and to bring the gospel to bear within these civil realms. And it makes a great statement about people like Abraham, David, and Daniel, that even, even though they had great wealth, you can go to Solomon and others, they had great wealth, but yet they were, um, it wasn't like they were less holy or they had less sin than other people. Uh, it all came down to faith, as we see in the, the great faith chapter in Hebrews. It is interesting to me, too, when I was, when I served a field, my fieldwork congregation in St. Louis during seminary, I remember the pastor there. We served at a inner city congregation, Bethlehem Lutheran Church in North St. Louis, one of my the dear saints of that congregation are still always in my prayers. And a lot of people were in a lot of poverty. And I remember the pastor one Sunday said, just because you don't have any money, it doesn't mean that the love of money is not part of your life. Yeah. And that really struck me. Um, and I think that saying is true. For example, if, if you were to tell your beloved bride tomorrow, we're going to give up land ownership because we need to love Jesus more. And okay, good. It's been a problem. Awesome. The love of money is the root of all evil. Let's go and do it. We're going to go out and be hermits. You know, be, I would love to hear how your wife would respond to this, but that's another conversation. And, you wouldn't and, hear it from me. I'll tell you that. You wouldn't hear it from me. <laughs> exactly. And, and you would go out into the, to, uh, the desert and, and live. Uh, guess what? Sin would still be a problem because <laughs> the heart needs to be changed and needs to be changed in Christ. So, uh, Pastor, kind of break that down for us, because there's a tendency, even that I noticed that, oh, well, those monks over at St. John's have chosen the holy way. Oh, the DeGroats, they they gave up everything, and they're just serving the Lord now, so they've chosen the holy way. Um, what's the problem with that understanding as, as Christians and how we understand the world? Well, I mean, it's the problem with it is it, it's it's a it's a it's a it's idolatry, I, I think, in 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 the sense that you know, to the to the way that your fieldwork pastor had had mentioned it, is you know, um, what the what the monks were doing in in the days um, that this article is written, um, is and is the idol of 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 removing themselves is to make themselves more holy or fit, whatever it happens to be, presentable to God. That's a that's a that's contrary to the gospel that, that Christ is, has died to make us perfect and righteous. Um, 
but you know, uh, don't get me wrong. I mean, there are certainly days I still wake up here in 2024 and think, gosh, wouldn't it be nice just to be, you know, in some Lutheran commune by some, some beach somewhere, um, you know, having services every Sunday and or every day and, and, um, you know, meditating and, and, uh, on the word of God and talking about the word of God. Mm-hmm. But, but my, my, my answer to that is, well, what's stopping us from doing that now? Right. Um, <laughs> You know, and to your point, you had mentioned, and I certainly am guilty of this too, is to say, you know, I, I am I am the number one perpetrator of, of how do I want to say this, giving you the task that I myself should be doing, um, you know, <laughs> is uh, to say, you know, I can see that the government needs to do certain things better, um, but my goodness, is there anything that I might be able to do as a baptized child of God? To bring the gospel to bear on the situation. And that may just be simply, uh, as you mentioned before, and as we talked about, praying for my government, uh, writing letters, et cetera, so on. And so, you know, not to necessarily focus on the on the, the hitches or the, the hiccups, but to understand that God has given us um, great opportunity to still work within the civil governance that 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 is around us. It is interesting to me. I'll, I'll make two analogies here. Uh, my wife and I coach track at the at Sartell High School, uh, where we reside. I've been doing that for 12 years. And I remember a few years ago, uh, there was another team that they would the they would have four or five young ladies. Uh, when they're about to throw a shot put in discus, they would go warm up together, and they would stretch, and then they would kind of do some drills and all this. And one of my athletes said to me, you know, we should – how come we don't do that? And I remember kind of feeling guilty, like, oh, my gosh, I'm not coaching them well. I'm not doing this right. And then this last spring, you know, I was still coaching, and and I showed them a routine of warming up. And I said, eh, you know, um, who's in control of doing this warm up? And they kind of, ah, uh, uh, and I said, you are. So don't look at someone else warming up and then and then get mad that they're warming up and you're not. What should you be doing? Go warm up. <laughs> you know, just go do this. And yeah. the same thing happens for us as Christians is uh, there was a, a book that came out called The Benedict Option by Rod Dreyer. Yeah. He's an Orthodox. And and there's a lot of things that we would not agree with vocationally, but there's some stuff that he has very well done. And one of them was that his family made the, the change is that in order for them, I think the rule was in the Orthodox Church that in order for you to have communion on Sunday, you would have to go through... Um, uh, evening prayer, or I can't remember exactly what it was on Saturday evening. And he's like, well, I don't want to do that. Cause I watch football on Saturday evening. I do this, I do this, you know, our family <laughs> goes and does something else. And, and he kind of figured out, I was like, wait, no, this is like, no, give us a better option. Basically he was telling the priest, but the reality was like, wait, no, I, let's go. We're called to worship the Lord. We're going to go worship the Lord. And then on Sunday, we're going to take communion. I'm not saying that's what Lutherans should do. I'm just saying that that was, of course, yeah, it's the word of God that we're supposed to hear. So it's like, listen, you have to make a choice in your life. Am I going to follow the word of God or am I going to follow all these other right. things? And don't blame somebody else for you not being in the word of God. Be in the word of God. Like much like my athletes blaming me for not warming up. Like, no, actually, you can do that on your own. So, Pastor, right. any, any thoughts on that and how we navigate um, this life? Part of it is just go do the word of God and be a good citizen. Yeah, well, I mean, OK, I mean, but I, I would make the claim and I, maybe it's a, a bridge too far. But, you know, we're all inclined to a form of monasticism. You know, I mean, right. how often have we heard? Well, I find so much more peace at the lake. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. My goodness, this is what the monks are saying is that, you know, the, the peace comes from the tranquility and the and the lack thereof, uh, you know, the lack of, 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 of trouble. But that's contrary to what our word says. He, he, he gives us peace in the midst of this. And I think that's what this article is saying is that, OK, gosh, you know, the world's on fire. My own hair's on fire, whatever it happens to be. I'm worried about where to go and what to do this, that and the other thing. And and, you know. Of course, I mean, it is our Lord has oriented our hearts to what? To him, you know, his heart now beats within us. And, and you know, you know, once again, you know, and I think a lot of Christianity is bared, is born in the ascension. Again, I hate to keep bringing that up, but it's just <laughs> such a wonderful, you know, uh, place where you understand that, you know, that when the angels say, you know, what are you looking at? What they're basically saying is, what are you looking for? He's not here. Jesus isn't here. I mean, yes, of course, we know that there's tranquility at the lake or or watching our kids score a goal on a Sunday morning or or 
or whatever it happens to be. Um, and, and we, you know, to our shame and in violation of the third commandment, give in to those temptations. And, you know, as pastors, we have to say, cease from your evil, cease from this. You know, God has things that are greater for you here in his church and to share, not just for you individually, but the church is the body. It's all the people that are there uh, that you can share this collectively with. It's just an amazing thing where, where God has really made this simple in the face of, of, of I, who continue to somehow find a way to make it more complicated. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, you know, what, what peace we have to know uh, of that, that simplicity that God gives to us. I'll say this too, that clearly this does not tell us that you need to give up everything all your possessions, your land, and so forth. But I will challenge you on this, and I have to challenge myself on this. What are some things that are getting in the way of you hearing the gospel, being in the word of God, living a holy life? And are those things maybe you need to, one, repent over, but also to kind of remove from your life? And that's just a reminder for us once again. And where do we look? We look again to the cross, to the empty tomb, And also the ascension. Pastor keeps bringing it up. Exactly right. Jesus is still at work in our world. Pastor, we have five minutes left. I want to get to this last portion, as you mentioned before, that this really brings it together quite well as we look at this article. We're on page 196, number 65. This entire topic about public affairs has been clearly set forth by our theologians. Very many good people working in the state and in in business have declared that they have been greatly benefited by it. Before, troubled by the opinions of the monks, they troubled whether the gospel allowed these public offices and business. As a result, we have repeated these things so that outsiders may also understand that the doctrine we follow does not wreck the authority of magistrates and the dignity of public ordinances. Rather, they are strengthened even more. Previously, the importance of these matters was greatly clouded over by these silly monastic opinions. They preferred the hypocrisy of poverty and humility to the state and the family. The latter have God's command, while this platonic community, monasticism, does not. He brings it together quite well. And what is he telling us in this last section? Well, I, I just I, as you're reading that, I thought of a, a story. We, we were in Philadelphia. You came and visited us there a couple of times. Right. And, and, you know, um, I remember in Philadelphia, you know, convincing myself that that we couldn't see to you know even one prayer office in the in the morning so i challenged myself over a week or two um to get to all my appointments in philadelphia uh not be a car but be a train and 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 whatnot and to try to do three prayer offices at the church uh at the church uh every day um and much to my surprise um what i found and i think this is what he's talking about there's great joy in finding (laughs) Mm -hmm. you know of what our Lord says, you seek ye first the kingdom of, of heaven and all these things will be added unto you, is I was, by the grace of God, able to be where our Lord has promised to be three times a day, matins, uh, vespers, and Compton service. Um, and um, I was over the moon and surprised with how much time I had. But what that required is that I talk to my wife. It that required that I talk to the parishioners, that that um, I see to the business in my vocation. And I think that's what it says in the middle there. But, you know, by the kind of doctrine which we follow, what what, what doctrine are they talking about? Um, I would argue it's the doctrine of vocation. Mm-hmm. And is to say, uh, who are we? Well, by the grace of God, we are so many wonderful and good things uh, by virtue of our vocations. Um, and we pray that our Lord would rightly order order them uh, and make it clear. Uh, to us, um, what what our vocations are in the moments that we find ourselves in. One picture that sticks in my mind was a picture that was in a Good News magazine. Um, these are wonderful magazines that speak about certain subjects, and one of them was vocation. And it had this picture that I believe was I don't know was written or excuse me painted, but it has a picture of two monks kind of out in a field, and then it has a at the same time you see a picture of a family walking down the road, clearly going to the city. And it was very much so a understanding of there's holiness in what this family is doing and not trying to say those monks are sinful and horrible and terrible or something. Right. But really emphasizing there is holiness in this estate. There's holiness in your daily life. There's holiness because God is watching over it all. You don't have to go away for it. 
Um, and secondly, you go to the lake and get that tranquility. You know, are you surrounded by God's word when you're doing it? Or is this, you know, are you start, do you lead to, which is a problem here in Minnesota, start worshiping the creation as opposed to the creator? Yeah. Another challenge for all of us in our hearts. But pastor, as we look at this, we understand um, that God still reigns from ascension and reigns on high. We have a minute left in our time. How would you summarize uh, what we just uh, covered today and encourage our listeners in Christ? We are set free by the gospel, and our Lord bestows those gifts to us within uh, within His church. Uh, he's given us amazing and wonderful vocations, in which um, are, as you had mentioned, are, are holy and wonderful in His sight, uh, and 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 wonderful gifts. The, the the most precious gift of all that we have to give is is the forgiveness of sins and and to be reconciled to our brothers, uh, and to live at peace with one another. Uh, and 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 in that, you know, to share the love of our Lord that He has sh- shared to us. He's first loved us, and and we 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 love each other as a result of this. And and this uh, particular article, I think, really does no pun intended, uh, set it all in order uh, that we might be able to see uh, where He is and 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 what He's doing for us. Pastor Adam DeGroat of Calvary Lutheran Church in Rio Rancho, New Mexico, clearly confessing the scriptural truth of political order. Pastor DeGroat, thank you for being our guest. My pleasure. I'm your host, Pastor Brady Finnern. Thank you for joining us, and the Lord keep you safe in the palm of his hand.